It's our pleasure to be joined by the most loved sideline reporter in all of the just world, it seems like. And you have about 100% approval rate in the state of Oklahoma as well because of all your softball stuff. Holly, Holly Rowe is in the house. What's up? Hi. Well, as long as I'm the most loved by you, that's all I care about. Um, I, I'm, I'm just so honored to be on your podcast. I'm so proud of this podcast. You've made it so big, so amazing, and I listen all the time, and I just am very honored to be on here. Well, we are, we're thrilled to have you, and I, I know you got a lot going on, right, with it being the day before the title game, so let's just get right to it. Let's dive into it, and Holly, the first question I've got for you is kind of, what's the, what's the vibe out there in LA for this game? Like, does it feel like the national championship game? I'm always kind of skeptical when... When it's out in California, right, there was a weird uh, – when it was at Levi's there in Santa Clara and everyone was like, this is terrible. Like, how does it feel? It feels really good. I think because um, the team hotels are right downtown Los Angeles. Georgia is staying at the JW Marriott at LA Live. And, like, literally three minutes away, um, TCU staying at the Intercontinental. So there's a ton of, like, stuff going on downtown. The LA Convention Center was the site of media days. So I would say there's buzz, like everywhere you go, there's billboards, there's signage. And um, it's January and it's about 70 degrees and sunny today. I've just been outside. Um, we're right across the street from the beach and it's beautiful. And all of us are just like, oh, this is what life is like in January for many people in the world. I, I'll take it. So I think it's cool. Um, we went to the stadium yesterday to SoFi and it is so gorgeous so i would say this is a success out here that's my opinion now i don't know that anyone would have picked that tcu would be for the first big 12 team to make the national championship in the uh in the playoff era but here we are um you know it, it felt like whenever they just got into the playoff that maybe it was kind of like a David and Goliath situation, and and now they've made the championship game. Does it feel like does, does it feel like people are treating TCU as a massive underdog out there? Yeah, they are a massive underdog. I mean, Vegas says that right now, and I think a lot of people think that. But I'm I'm really proud of myself. I'll tell you this because in November, Paul Feinbaum had me on his show, and you know that's an an SEC audience, and people want to talk about SEC football. And I said on that show in November. You all better get ready because TCU is going to be in the college football playoff. I had just seen them um, really physically dominate a Texas team that's that's big and strong. And I was like, TCU can play with anybody because they're this really unique combination of speed and physicality. Um, they are freaking fast. Can I swear on this show? We didn't get you absolutely record. can do whatever you like, Miss Rose. Okay, well, I'll be I'll be polite. They're freaking fast. I don't know that people understand this. So, Gabe, you'll appreciate this. I'm obsessed with the nose tackle for TCU, Dominic Williams. He is 18 years old, starting at nose tackle. And he's like 5'10", 5'11", 300 pounds. And he can run like a 4'6". And so when they push on the line of scrimmage, he'll like get off a block, overwhelm somebody with strength, and then run and chase down people with his speed. So it's not like just like the wide receivers and the running backs that are fast for TCU. The linebackers are fast. The nose tackle is fast. The left guard is fast. So I'm I'm not shocked at all. I don't know that they can win this game without Kendra Miller, their running back, being at full strength. He is a tough nose, physical, quick runner that I think changes their offense. Um, so if he can't play, I think that's a huge question mark for TCU. Would be the only downside. You've you've had TCU a couple times. You've had Georgia. Do you think, and this was the big question going into the semifinal for TCU against Michigan, right? Would they be able to hold up at the line of scrimmage? And not only did they they hold up, they won that battle at the line of scrimmage against Michigan. Do you think TCU's got a chance to hold up at the line of scrimmage against Georgia? Okay, that is the $100,000 question right now. I've just got to get this to read this out to you. Okay, so left tackle, six four three ten. Left guard, 6'7", 3'10". Right tackle, 6'7", 3'30". This Georgia offensive line is massive. I mean, when you look at them in practice, and Gabe, you, don't, you and I have talked about this. I'm like, every time I go to the SEC and I see Georgia's offensive line, I'm just like, this is big boy football. 
So it, it can strength overwhelm speed, right? Um, can guys play with good pad leverage? Sometimes when you get a defensive player, and, and Teddy, I'd be curious for you to talk about this, and Gabe, you too, because you were an offensive lineman. How does a shorter, faster, but still strong guy impact you on the line of scrimmage? That's not what you wanted. That those measurables she listed off of that nose tackle are it's built not like what a you fire want. hydrant. That's not what you want to be blocking. <laughs> no, right, because he's under your pads and he's strong and he's in your. You know, it's not like your strength in a, center. In so. a perfect world, I would get defensive tackles that are six foot, that are strong as hell and have super long arms. In a perfect world, like that's that's what your D tackles are, right? But you know, that I'd also take all these guys that Georgia has at like <laughs> six four, three, you know. I'd, I'd, but they're I'd take massive, either, you, know? you know, like they're big, thick booty guys with a big power center they're just these massive offensive linemen so I'm really curious about that and then one other thing that I feel like everybody's missing and nobody's really talking about is um Kenny McIntosh for their running back um let me see what he said this is good he's like I want to be the one that gives us a spark and he did that against Ohio State he's the kid that had that big long run and then fell down with nobody tackling you remember that play but Dude, that was such some- a good call by Fowler <laughs> I the know. turf monster got him at the two. Yeah, and Chris was like, touchdown, wait, no. <laughs> he thought he was running in for a touchdown. But um, no, he, he is a big, strong, physical running back that no, no one's talking about. Like, have you heard anybody talking about Kenny McIntosh leading into this national championship game? Not only do I like McIntosh, especially what he can do catching the ball out of the backfield, I like Milton, too. Yeah, Kendall both Milton. of those dudes are NFL running backs, and I just don't think they get a ton of attention because their entire team is draft picks. Like, for the most, you know what I mean, for the most part. But I think both of those guys would start pretty much anywhere in the country. Like they, Everything. they're that good. Yeah. So, like, I feel like Georgia's running game isn't getting a ton of attention. Can TCU hold up against that? And then what other two two other things I want to drop on you? So um, Georgia maybe doesn't have the most explosive wide receiver core right now, but there's a kid named Adonai. We've been saying his name wrong all year. He taught me how to say it right yesterday. So Adonai Mitchell, they call him AD. He had a big game against the Buckeyes. He had three catches, but it was for 129 yards. He's been out for nine games this year. So he's back. He's healthy. I think he is a difference maker in this offense and that showed up against the Buckeyes. Um, And then the tight ends, you know, you know, Brock Bowers, everybody talks about Brock Bowers. I thought Ohio state for the most part did a pretty good job on him. I didn't think he was a game changer per se, although he had one play um, by staying in bounds that kind of changed the complexion of that game late. But I don't know. I just think Georgia has a lot of weapons. I, I really do. One of the big stories out there that a lot of people have started talking about is you know, TC runs the three, three, five defense and Michigan, it took them a long time to get acclimated to what it, what it's like and, you know, how they, how they defend the run and just what it's like. And they don't blitz a lot. They sit back in coverage and it's just like, it's a little bit different of a style. What's been the talk around Georgia's offense going up against that, that strange TCU defense. I'm glad you brought that up. I think it's a big deal. I think it's a really big deal. Um, three or four of the Georgia kids I talked to yesterday at media day mentioned it. And the the most important person that mentioned it was Stetson Bennett, the quarterback. He has been watching a ton of film. Um, He literally got off the plane. I was right at the airport when they got off the plane and he had his huge laptop with him. He watched film the whole five hour flight here because it's different. And I think his picture and what he sees is going to be very different. Um, Not only that, but the closing speed of the secondary of TCU, right? So you get your picture, you think you know what you want to throw and what's going to be open, and then it's not open so quickly. And he did say something to me that I was like, well, let's see if this turns out to be true. He said, we play in the SEC, we're used to fast teams. And I was like, I think TCU might be faster than you're you're planning for. So I think that's a big deal. And uh, the offensive line talked about the three, three, five, like where's the block coming from. They've actually changed a lot of their technique this week and have been working on some drills on double teaming and, and who can double and who who's got who and who's picking up who, but you know, it just changes everything about the fits up front. Holly, I, I know that 
this is going to spark a very long answer because I know how much you like Max Duggan. But how how crazy is this season for him, Ben? I mean, my good and I I will be the first to say I think I think TCU's got a pretty significant advantage at quarterback in the national title game. Like I, and I am a, I'm a Stetson Bennett believer. I think I give him a lot more respect than a lot of other people do, but I just think with what Duggan has been for TCU this year and what he can do with his legs after what we saw CJ Stroud do to Georgia's defense. I I just feel like Duggan, he can have a huge game and he's going to have to have a huge game for TCU to be in this. I'm glad you said that. I've been actually dying like all year. I've wanted to call you and be like, can we talk about Max second in the year he's having? Cause you and I have been covering him, you know, since he was a, a baby at TCU and just the journey, you know, from having heart surgery to losing the starting job this year and how he handled that. Um, this kid is as, as impressive as anyone I've ever seen. I voted for him pretty high in the, in the Heisman trophy balloting, honestly. Um, he's a winner. And the things that Georgia might present defensively that could be an issue, Max is good at. So, for example, if Georgia's defensive line pushes the pocket back and, and collapses the pocket or or he doesn't have a ton of time, he's really good at hanging in the pocket and stepping up and, and being okay under duress. He can roll out and extend plays with his legs. I actually had a long talk with Max yesterday about when will he slide? Can he be smart about when he slides? And he said, I feel like the officials always jip you on the slide yardage, you know, because they mark you down from the beginning of where you started to slide. Max hates that. So he has to be really smart and not get knocked out of this game. Um, You know, like you have to slide sometimes or you have to run out of bounds sometimes. So I want Max to be super competitive, super tough, and also super smart. Um, and then he cannot and and also realize that Georgia has some absolute creatures on defense that are going to try to take his head off. Exactly. That's the point. Yeah. Like you think you're tough and you are, and you have been, but you got to be really smart about what hits you take in this game. Well, that's going to be, I think that's probably the biggest factor win lose for TCU is what does he do with his legs? Uh, And you saw what uh, CJ Stroud did with Ohio state like that, that ended up being a huge factor. And that's not something that he typically does. And you know, I think a lot of people look at TCU's offense and and maybe feel like they can match up, but everything changes whenever the quarterback pulls it down and takes off running. Yeah, you know, all the numbers change. Um, you have to count for him as a runner, and that's something that Georgia's going to have to do. We haven't had our coaches' meetings yet. I'll talk with Kirby Smart here this afternoon. So I, I want to talk and get into that on how do you account for Max Duggan as a runner? What do you commit to him in the box do you spy him is he that much of a threat or you know how do you play that so i think that's an interesting piece of the game then another little fun battle that i feel like you two will appreciate um so alan ali is the center for tcu he's done a great job he's a transfer from smu he came in he already knew sunny dyke's system so he has been able to really kind of transform that offensive front well he's going to have number 88 jalen carter across from him And I asked him about that. And he said, I want to play in the NFL. I'm not scared of him. I'm going to have to block guys like him all the day. I have, I have plans to play on Sunday. This is, this is just going to be like what I'm trying to do in my life. And I loved that answer, right? Like he's not like worried about holding up against Jalen Carter. And now uh, this is breaking news. I'm only telling you guys, I was going to save this info for my game day hit tomorrow morning, but I'm going to give it to you because I love you guys. Um, Jalen Carter did not play great against Ohio state. He was tired. He was fatigued. He was on and off the field. I don't think he um, had a high motor for a lot of the reps he was in the game. And I think it showed up. Do do you guys agree with that? Definitely. Yeah. So I asked him about it and I said, okay, don't be mad at me, but I just need to ask you about fatigue against the Buckeyes. And he's like, oh yeah, I was tired. Like he totally owned it. He's like, I didn't, I didn't feel right. I wasn't in shape. And so every single day, since the Buckeyes game, he's been running. He's been doing sprints. He's been doing long jogs. He got up yesterday morning before media day at 8 a.m. to run on the treadmill in the team hotel. So I like that Jalen Carter has taken some personal accountability for his fatigue against the Buckeyes. And he's had nine days to get in better shape. And I do think you can change your cardio and your, you know, you know I don't think it's that unthinkable that he can be in much better shape for this game. So I thought that was kind of cool story. He should have just told you he had the flu. <laughs> that would have been better. 
It's like, no, I was sick. I was, I was dehydrated. Sick. Yeah, no, no, I just, you know. I that that's interesting. And he he's got to be a big factor for them because clearly, I mean, everyone expecting him to be probably the first defensive tackle off the board in, in the draft. So I, I'm excited to watch him and Avila, the left guard for for TCU, who I think is going to be an early round guy as well. That's going to be that's going to be a fun battle. What what sense do you get of like the pressure that Georgia feels being as big of a favorite as they are, but not only that, but having the possibility to go back to back because we just, feel I mean, we haven't seen it. Right. I mean, we just don't no. see it a lot. Hasn't happened since 2011, 2012 when Alabama did it. It's rare. It's not like th this is a really hard thing to do to go back to back. There's so much that has to go right. I asked Stetson Bennett about it yesterday, about the weight of expectation. And he said, I can't feel it. I can't worry about it. I, if I think about that, it will hurt me. And the only things I can do to prepare for this game are things that will help me. So that's what he's saying, which is a good answer. But I can tell you this, Kirby Smart has been really tight. Um, he feels it. Practice was unbelievable yesterday. Like he, he is on a microphone during practice because he always would lose his voice. And so you get to hear every single thing that Kirby Smart says at practice and the attention to detail. They're lining up in special teams to work on field goals. And he's like, pay attention here, pay attention. You think this wasn't important? Ask Ohio State if this kick is important. And like executing a kick at the end of the game to win a game. And um, it was an awesome practice. One of the best college football practices I've ever been to from an attention to detail standpoint. Then we go to TCU. And they're playing all old school uh, hip hop rap from Cali. You know, it's like Snoop and, and all the guys. So it was loose. And the practices are a little different in this regard. TCU does the Thursday kind of light walk through. And then Friday is their shells kind of get ready for the game. So they were different styles of practice. But TCU's loose. They're dancing. They're having fun. Um, and I, I just remember thinking like, either this is really smart because they're loose and they're not, they don't feel the pressure or they're not understanding the moment that they're about to step into. And we'll, we'll see which one it is when the game kicks off. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of goes towards what I was, was going to ask you is like, is there a sense that TCU, you know, they made the playoff, which is a huge accomplishment and you know, they're, they're on house money at that point. Right. And then, they win the semifinal, they're in the national championship. Is there a sense that they're happy with making it no matter no matter what the result at this point? No, I think they believe they can win. And part of that reason is how they're winning, right? Like they dominated Michigan. I know Michigan came back and made some plays late in that game, but you know, they're up big on Michigan, the Big Ten champs that had just trounced Ohio State. I think they feel like they are competitive with everybody and they have been this year. They really have been. Um, they have had a tendency to get down late early in games throughout the course of the regular season and have to stage these furious, dramatic comebacks. They can't afford to do that against Georgia, but Sonny Dykes told us a cool story. So he coached at Louisiana tech when they were 10 and 0 one year, and they had a chance to win a game to go to the orange bowl for the first time in school history. What really big deal for Louisiana tech. He said, I was so tight and anxious, and that's how my team played. Then he was at Cal. They were 7-0, and played a tight, anxious game, and lost to Utah. Um, he said, one other example, what was it? SMU. He was at SMU. They were 10-0, and and again, felt the weight of that perfect season, was tight and anxious. So Sonny Dyke said, I cannot coach that way. My team feels it. So I'm telling you, he is chill. He is you know, if it's on the inside, he's not showing it, but he is making sure his team does not feel anxious. It's the power of the hypno toad for Sonny. <laughs> that's what he, that's what he's channeling. Now we, it. we, in both the semifinals, awesome games, higher scoring games. Is, is that the type of game you're expecting tomorrow night? Are you expecting some points to be scored in this bad boy? Yeah. Big time. I think Quentin Johnson, the good TC wide receiver said it best. There's some holes in that Georgia defense. I don't think this is an elite secondary. And I, I don't mean that in a disparaging way. It's just reality. They've given up explosive plays. And I think TCU feels like they can hit explosive plays against Georgia. 
can they run the ball against them? I, I don't know about that, especially if Kendra Miller can't go. Um, Amari DiMarcado is a six-year player. He's been there. I talked to him at practice yesterday. He's a big, thick running back for TCU. Can he take this challenge in this role and run with it against the nation's best run-stopping defense? That's, that's a big question mark. But I do think TCU feels like they can hit some big plays in the passing game, period. The well, last thing I've got is what does it mean, if anything, if TCU wins the game for like the overall landscape of college football? Um, a Big 12 team goes in and, and knocks out the, you know, the Georgia team that's trying to go back to back. Uh, TCU's already making some really big waves in the transfer portal. Is does it change any of the balance of power? I mean, I, I know it's not going to all of a sudden the Big 12 is the great conference, but does it do anything to the balance of power in college football at all? Yeah, I think it's healthy for college football, right? I think if you look, um, people get SEC fatigue. And, you know, like I don't have it because I appreciate the level of football that's played there. And I, I just think it's awesome. And they get good players and they do a good job developing those players. But outside of the SEC footprint, people are sick of it and they don't want to hear about that. So I think it would be healthy for college football to, sh to show some parity and to show that there's good football being played outside of the South. Um, I think Michigan, the way they lost, that, that was bad for the Big Ten. Ohio State, you know, I felt like they were more competitive for sure. And I think if Ohio State, I'm, I'm going to still double down on this, if they would have had Travion Henderson Mayan Williams available for that game. And then their tight end got hurt early in the game. And then of course, Marvin Harrison went out in the fourth quarter. Like if Ohio state had their weapons for that game, I still think Ohio state was the best team in the country this year. I, I really believe that, but they just had a really bad injury situation at the wrong time. Um, so I think it's good for college football when more team, the more teams that are competitive and are in the conversation, the better for college football period. Last question I've got for you. And it's about just covering the game. Best part about covering a national title game and worst part. There's no worst part. It, it's like the dream come true. Like I, I'm a little person that I was five years old when I went to my first college football game. And I, I would tell you college football is probably the longest, most important relationship of my lifetime outside <laughs> of my family. Like what I'm not joking. I'm not joking. Uh, BYU Hawaii. Oh, nice. Yep. Like in the 19 and the 1970s, late 70s, BYU was really good. Quarterback Gifford Nelson. Um, you know, I remember it vividly. And so I've just been in love with college football ever since then. So like I was sitting on the sidelines last yesterday at practice and Claude Felton, the longtime sports information guy from Georgia and Lauren Smith, their longtime beat writer. And he's just an amazing guy. We're sitting there and I looked at both of them. They're in their 70s. And I was like, I just want us to sit here and have a moment together of how far all of us have come and how special this is that we together at the national championship covering Georgia. It's just really cool. I started bawling like this you is so crying <laughs> the way. Uh, yeah. You, you know, we will, but um, I'll never take it for granted. It is an honor of my lifetime to be here in these moments. So the, the best part is I've worked really, really long and really hard to be here. And I'm proud of myself. You should be girl. You're the best. Right. Now, I, I said last question. I do have one more. And okay. I'll, I'll give Kirk Herbstreet credit. I think when you're having to call your alma mater in a game that's as tight as that semifinal game was between Ohio State and Georgia, it couldn't have been that easy to remain neutral. Did he handle that loss all right? I thought that so, had, yeah. That had I mean, to be devastating. Has an attachment. You cannot deny your attachment to places. Like I felt the same way covering Utah in the Rose Bowl. I want them to do their best and do well, but I'm also going to cover Penn State and celebrate Sean Clifford going out on top. And, you know, like I want to make sure I'm that unbiased where I can celebrate both things. I think Kirk handled it really well. Like, I don't know if people remember, but his son is on the team. Um, his son plays for Ohio State. So I think he is very, very classy that way. I think he handled it very well. Um, he, he just does a great job. I just really respect him. And then Chris Fowler, again, like we have a cool, a cool team. I think it's been really special this year. Could you imagine us having to do that, Ted? <laughs> There's no chance. <laughs> no, no <laughs> neutrality going on at all for me. 
<laughs> I mean, there's, but there's a difference of what you, what your heart wants and the insides of you want and, and being able to put that aside while you do your job. I think it's possible. It It's yeah. challenging, you know, like it is challenging, but I think it's possible. Yeah, there's no doubt. Well, have a great call tomorrow. We'll be watching. Love you. Love you so much. Thank you for having me. It's a great honor. Thank you guys.